Human Genome Project. It's basically the entire instruction book for an organism. Was it harder to discover the human genome or be appointed by two different presidents? Both of those have certain challenges. How much longer do you think people really can keep increasing their longevity? We might figure out how to achieve that by tinkering a bit with the biology. Today, you are the 16th director of the NIH. You're the only person who was appointed by two different presidents. You were initially appointed by President Obama mm. and then subsequently by President Trump. So. As a person who co-discovered the human genome, was it harder to discover the human genome or be appointed by two different presidents? <laughs> I guess both of those have certain challenges associated. I did not expect to still be in this position after January of 2017, because I, uh, I knew about the history, too. And NIH directors appointed by the president uh, virtually always have turned over when there's a new president. Somehow they uh, made a mistake here, I guess, and kept me on. When you were younger, you were, if not an atheist, an agnostic. Mm -hmm. How did you transform yourself from being either an atheist or agnostic to somebody who's a committed Christian? It does seem like an odd story, doesn't it? Well, growing up on the farm, my parents were not opposed to religion. They just didn't think it was particularly relevant. So I had no religious background. Got to college, you know, those conversations in the dorm about what do people believe, and I didn't think I believed in any of it. So I was an agnostic, but I, by the time I got to graduate school, I was shifting even more to being an atheist, and I would not be too comfortable keeping quiet if somebody was talking about the supernatural, because it was all about, you know, nature and how you study it and how you describe it. And then I went to medical school. And that third year of medical school where you're thrust out onto the wards and you're sitting at the bedside of wonderful people uh, whose lives are under threat and many of whom are not going to survive. And you really start to realize that your own thinking about life and death has been pretty unsophisticated uh, compared to the reality of what these people are facing. And I realized that I was a scientist. I was supposed to make decisions about really important questions based on evidence, and I'd never really considered whether there might be evidence supporting the idea that there really is a God. I just assumed the answer was no. And that was a bit unsettling, but it seemed like something that I shouldn't ignore. So I began sort of asking those people I knew who were believers, how can you do this without checking your brain at the church door? Because isn't this just a, a perfect example of irrationality? And they told me, well, actually, no, there's a pretty profound rational basis for faith. You might try uh, reading C.S. Lewis, for starters. I'd never really heard much about C.S. Lewis. But picking up some of the things he'd written, particularly Mere Christianity, made it clear to me, oh my gosh, there's an incredibly compelling, intellectual, rational basis for faith, which I had totally missed and assumed didn't exist. It took me a couple of years mm -hmm. of fighting against that, trying to prove that this was all wrong and that I could stick with my agnosticism. But ultimately, I realized I couldn't, that it was so compelling. And then I had to figure out, okay, which of the ways of understanding God is going to be the one that I can make the most sense out of? And after many considerations of various faith traditions, ultimately the person of Jesus appealed to me in a remarkable way as a historical figure, not a myth, who had answers to questions that I really needed answers for, and whose life right. and death and resurrection seemed to be remarkably well documented. Just to college at University of Virginia? Yep. And were you an academic superstar there? I was a bit of a nerd. Uh, you know, I got excited about science in high school. I should give testimony right now to the importance of having really good teachers in high school. What got me interested in science didn't come from my family. No scientists, no physicians for generations around. Right. It was that course I had from John House in 10th grade at Lee High School in Stanton, Virginia. So you then went to Yale to get a PhD mm -hmm. in what? Uh, in chemical physics. So it was very what is quantum, chemical physics? quantum mechanics. Okay. It was uh, mathematical, physical science. Okay, so your parents are obviously mm -hmm. proud. You get a degree at University of Virginia. You have a PhD from Yale. And now you're ready to get a job, right? <laughs> you would think so, wouldn't you? <laughs> what happened? Here I was as a graduate student, sort of working late at night at 2 in the morning, and there's another guy of one floor above me who was also there in the middle of the night, and he was working in a lab on DNA. And the more I read about it and talked to him about it and began to read articles about it, the more excited I got about this is an area of science that is ready to burst forward with all kinds of potential. And frankly, I was feeling a little bit lonely 
and a little bit like what I was pursuing in terms of quantum mechanics and second order differential equations that nobody could solve, maybe that wasn't going to be my way of making the world a really much better place and maybe there was something else I could do. So you got your medical degree. As a medical student, I was trying to figure out how do I put this all together? My appreciation, my love for digital information, for mathematics, which is what I got out of chemistry and physics, with this messy thing called medicine. Well, where does it all come together? In genetics. DNA is digital information. It's, it's, it's something you can compute on. Okay. And it also is fundamental to life, and it's fundamental to medicine. So by the time I was halfway through my first year as a medical student, I knew I wanted to be a geneticist. Let me talk a little bit about something that you did that brought you to national fame and attention, mm. and that's the Human Genome Project. What was the Human Genome Project, and why do we care about your having co-discovered it? Well, good question. So what is the genome anyway? It's basically the entire instruction book which is written in the language of DNA for an organism. So we humans have a genome, uh, so do all other li living organisms, animals, plants, bacteria, they all have a genome. Ours is pretty big. Uh, if you think of DNA as a language, it's an interesting one. It has just four letters in its alphabet, which we call A, C, G, and T, because they're abbreviations for chemical bases. And our genomes are six billion of those letters. You get three billion from mom and three billion from dad. That's a lot, although it's pretty amazing to contemplate that that's a bounded set of information and that seems to be sufficient to build a human being from a single cell. And when the Genome Project was started in 1990, we knew very little uh, of that information. We had little snippets here and there of DNA information, but the whole thing loomed in front of us almost like an impossible task because our technology was nowhere near up to the ability to read that number of letters in any kind of measurable time. So why is a person watching this or any human being better off because we now have mapped sure. the human genome? Well, there were many questions about that. Uh, the whole thing got finished in 2003, and there were some silly comments about, okay, medicine will be transformed in the next two weeks because of this. Of course not. Six billion letters that you don't really know the language, it's gonna take a while to figure it out. What's happened now over those last 14 years since then has, however, been transformative in medicine and particularly in cancer. Cancer now, if you develop that terrible disease, you want to know exactly what misspellings have happened in the genome of those cancer cells that are causing those good cells to go bad. And that is a transforming capability that's now affordable because of the Genome Project and pretty much has changed everything in terms of the way in which we approach the diagnosis and treatment of cancer. Today, I think it's the case you can have, well, anybody can have their human genome mapped for, is it $1,000 or less? It's even a little less now, yeah. And have you had yours? <laughs> you know, I have not had the whole thing read out, but I had a sampling of it, gosh, eight years ago. I was writing a book about personalized medicine and I wanted to use myself as a guinea pig. And so, yeah, I learned some things in that process of doing that about my own future risks that I found useful. One thing I did learn was that my risk of diabetes was substantially higher than the average person based on my genetic inheritance. And that was sort of a shock because that's not something that's run in my family. But my family are all pretty lean athletic people, so maybe they managed to avoid it. That was at a point where I was not lean and athletic. I was uh, kind of indulging in too many muffins and honey buns and not doing any exercise, and I was, I was getting chunky. <clears throat> and that was enough to motivate me eight years ago to change all of that, to lose 35 pounds, to get an exercise program. I'm a different person now than I would have been if I'd stayed on that really? same path. Well, muffins and honey buns are not healthy for you? Is that what you're <laughs> they saying? They are not healthy okay. for anybody, I'm afraid. <laughs>